Hey everyone, welcome to the Marisol Nichols podcast. Today, we are so fortunate to have as our guest, Ori Freeman. Now, Ori is a human trafficking survivor. She is an activist, she is a mom, and she is an incredible person. Man, you guys are just going to love her. And we are so fortunate to have her on. And Ori, thank you so much for sharing your story with us and everything that you have been through. I hope that our listeners give you all the support that you deserve in this world. You are a phenomenon. All right, let's get started. Okay, so Ori, first of all, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. I can't, I can't thank you enough, and I'm so blown away by you because you are inspiring. And you and I have very similar backgrounds, and we're probably going to get into it in this thing. But you, and I like to say, same with me, don't let that define who we are or what we do with our lives. And you have lived through so much. I can't thank you enough for, for sharing your story, for coming on the podcast, for letting everyone know, because you are inspiring. And I'm, I'm, I'm just, I'm so excited for this. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's really a um, good opportunity. If we can start with, you, you were born in prison. Yeah. So my biological mom um, was fighting murder at the time. And she has her own testimony as far as like what she'd been through as a child. You know, she was raped at nine years old and my grandmother um, told her she must have liked it. And my mother started off her journey and her path um, and by ended up running away and ended up being in prostitution as well when she was really young at 14 years old. My mother tells a story about how she, the first time she ever turned a trick, which is somebody purchasing sex was, she was literally in elementary school. She was in the fifth grade. And it shows the generational trauma already. And like the generational like cycle that had to at some point be broken, which thank God it was with me. Um, and she ended up having me in prison because she um, was fighting a murder case. And the crazy part about it is that I just recently found out what well, me and my mother was talking. And she thought one guy was my father, but come to find out my father is actually Hispanic. My mother's African-American, but my father was a purchaser. So he was a cab driver Oof. and he was one of her regulars. Um, and so that, that part of the story, right? Came from a woman who was in prostitution and a man from who purchased sex from little girls. So, um, mm -hmm. and I did not know my biological mom. I didn't know any of my sisters or anything like that. We were separated kind of at birth. Um, and at two days old, I was handed over to the foster care system and I was adopted by my adopted mom and her name was Lorraine Freeman. So that's how I got the name Ori Freeman, which ironically, when I was born, I didn't even, I was born with no name. You know, my name was baby girl Pearson and I had a booking number literally that was tied around my ankle wow. and as I was, you know, sitting in the, and it might've been a couple of more days that I was in prison with my mom until she was released until they could get me down to the, um, to the regular hospital and then be adopted out. So my mom was a single mom. We were on welfare, lived in Section 8. Um, my mother worked three jobs in order to kind of like provide for me, which was really not really jobs. She was really like keeping up the apartments in order to live there at the Section 8 buildings. Right. And Section 8 is kind of like a public housing thing. So it was literally eight of us living in a one bedroom apartment, eight, like 416 square foot, literally. Um, concrete walls, wow. like no air condition, not a lot of ventilation coming through. And growing up though, like I didn't know I was poor. Like I didn't, I had no idea that we were poor. Um, my mother did a really good job at making sure that I always was fed, made sure that I always had clothes on my back and the things that I needed. And I honestly, when I share my story, a lot of times, you know, I had a really good childhood. Like when I would honestly say, like from the ages to like the day that I was born up until probably about five, like I in up until like eight, I would say. But I come from right. a black family that was like, we didn't talk about what happened inside of the home. Neither did we talk about our business outside of the home. So, um, right. and children were always separated from adults, like extremely. So my uncle being in prison or my auntie doing drugs, like they weren't in prison. They were in the army or, oh, my aunt was on a mission trip. Like, no, she was smoking dope, you know, like, but we didn't talk about the truth. So I grew up in the church, you know, I literally, um, sang in the choir. My mother was a deaconess. My grandmother sat in the front row every Sunday morning. I couldn't even eat a peppermint. And I had this really strong foundation <laughs> of faith. I will say that. But my mother sheltered me throughout my childhood, you know, and I think a lot of that was like out of protection too. Like I grew up in a gang infested area, a lot of drugs, a lot of prostitution was happening at the time. 
Um, but there was no honest conversation. I didn't know I was adopted. Right. Um, and I was living in this false, like this false family. Like these lies that were being told consistently, consistently. Nobody ever talked about what happened when the street lights went off. Nobody ever talked about the vulnerable, the unseen, and you know, the misrepresented in like in the world. Like we didn't have those type of educational conversations. We didn't talk about the truth in our family. Um, and my mother, honestly, throughout my years of healing now, she did the best she could with what she had, trying to break generational poverty, generational cycles of abuse. Um, my mother comes from a generation, my adoptive mother comes from a generation of like the hush hush generation. They didn't talk about when someone's abused, someone was abused or molested. Right. You didn't talk about those things, you know, and you kind of led it to the church. So I, I understand. I so understand. Now at 26 years old, I recently had my first memory of the first time I was ever molested was at five years old by a neighbor that lived in our building that used to make me and her son do sexual things. My mother was very private. So when I say I was sheltered, like I really want parents to understand, like when you shelter your kids, it doesn't stop them from being ex exposed to danger, exposed to bad people. You know, we have to make people aware right. and educate our children. Um, and because because yep. of my experience, I can now educate my child. But that was the earliest memory at five. Um, my life kind of started changing, um, I would honestly say, in about the third grade, third, fourth grade. I started getting bullied really, really bad. So my mother had the opportunity to send me to either the local community school or a better school that was out in neighborhoods that was more like affluent, like out, uh, like much more advanced, much more the education mm -hmm. was better. Uh, and brutally honest, more communities that was more wealthier than ours. And a, right. and a huge big thing was I bounced back and forth throughout elementary from my local school to a private school. And the thing about it was, was that when I went to the local school, I felt like I belonged there, right? It was kids that had exactly what I had. Parents didn't have a lot of money. So it wasn't about all the things that we wore. It really was about our education and friendship. Um, and then when my mother transferred me to the private school, I got bullied really badly. I was a very timid kid. Like people that know me now would be like, you, Ori, was timid. Like I was a very quiet kid. And very early on, I would honestly say around the ages of like seven and eight, like I didn't feel like I belonged anywhere, you know, and I always was belonging to the outcasts, to the, the kids that were the weird kids, to the, I was weird. I was, I wasn't like, I wasn't around the popular girls. I couldn't fit in. And I literally hung out with like all the outcasts, like all the kids that like we all were different. Either we were adopted, foster care, and we didn't all didn't know that yet, but we were just different. Um, yeah. And throughout my elementary school kind of years, um, around like seven and eight, nobody, like my mother didn't really teach me about like self-defense or speaking up for myself. It was always about telling the teacher, but not having a voice. So very early on from the age of five, and already seven and eight, I'm starting to learn that I don't have a voice. Um, when I was living in this one bedroom apartment, I had an aunt that was really, really close to me. She was like my second mom. She took me to school, taught me how to tie my shoe, taught me my timetables because my mother had to work so much to provide. Um, she was my safe person. She, I love that lady with all my heart. Um, I would rather sleep with her in the bed versus my mom, you know, sleep with her on the couch than my right. mom. And I was very attached to her. Um, before the next kind of like abuse started at eight, a lot was happening. My aunt, um, I started to see things that I didn't understand. My aunt was on drugs. I didn't understand when we would go to hotels and pick her up or the things I would see on the table were drugs. I didn't know that. I didn't know that going to see my uncle, he was in a rehab and that he had just done time. Right. Like, um, and he had an addiction problem or why he was stealing. Like, I didn't know what was going on as a kid. Like, imagine already not understanding what someone was doing to my body at five, but now not really understanding why the adults were doing things around me, no explanation. I'm confused. Not understanding why people won't accept me and they won't love me. But I was looking for love so much and acceptance. I used to give these girls my whole lunch. Like my mom would pack me a little lunch. Like I would have my fruit snacks. Like I didn't have to eat the cafeteria lunch. And I would give my lunch away in order to pay someone already right at eight years old learning how to pay someone for a friendship mm -hmm. being bought already at a price for something that was right. the condition I already was being 
kind of like I was already doing that early on. And my aunt right. was like, Ori, how come you coming home hungry? Like we pack you a lunch. And then she ended up going up to the school and finding out I was being bullied. Um, but it just didn't help. My mother transferred me back to the local school. And it was just inconsistent, very inconsistent. You know, yeah. I had no stability outside of the home. Um, and then we ended up moving. First, the first person that moved out, my mother ended up getting the opportunity to clean up another apartment. So when she would clean up the apartments and collect the rent, we got to move to another bigger unit, you know? So my aunt moved first. And because she was my safe person at eight years old, I was nine at eight. I remember the first time I felt abandonment. She was moving to San Diego. She was getting cleaned up. She got a job. And I remember being in the streets, a strong memory, in the middle of the street, in the projects. And I was crying and screaming and holding on to her leg, like, please don't leave me. Please don't leave me. And that's my first experience of abandonment. Can you talk about what happened at nine and a half? But my life within one year time span, it flew to where my behavior started changing. When I was going to the private school, I remember the first time that I gave this fifth grade boy oral sex on the bus. I probably had to be about like eight at the time. And I remember that. His name was Marcus and I gave him oral sex. And I remember being at this summer camp, nine and a half. And I remember liking this boy that was 13 years old. And he started to like touch on me when I would play at the park, things like that. And I think I started recognizing at that age that love and acceptance attached to somebody physically touching you. And I think that was the first time when I started acknowledging and, and recognizing that that's like thinking that's what love was. And I remember giving him oral sex. And um, one day after like, it probably was like around, um, I was almost 10 years old. Um, I ended up going to the fruit truck. Like we called it the fruit truck, but it was like these trucks that used to sell all these different snacks and stuff like that. And I went off to one and we ended up, I ended up going through like the alley and going through this building. And I seen this boy that I did think was cute. And they were all like inside hanging out. And I remember him like calling me into there. And you know, a part of you was kind of like, okay, oh my God, oh my God, he notices me. Oh, this, oh my gosh, he notices me. Right. And I go in there and I'm thinking like, I'm just going to kiss him, you know, and he ends up raping me with two other boys um, that were both, all three of them were gang members. But, and I remember, but I remember the details. I remember him kissing me. I remember him touching me. And because of the things I've been exposed to already, I'm thinking like, okay, okay, maybe this is what it is. This is what love is. This is what sex is. This is, this is, this is love. Like, this is sex. Oh my God, I'm going to have sex. I never had a conversation with my mom about it. My mom didn't even sign my permission slip to, to for sex ed about when a, when a girl starts going through a menstrual. I was so right. very naive and just had these, if, you know, if the parents are not teaching, the children will find out from somewhere else. And a lot of times it's pretty wrong the wrong mouse in the wrong way. And I remember telling him, stop. And I was like, stop, stop. I don't want to do this. And I remember him sticking his penis in me. And I remember he called the other two boys in there and they raped me. And I remember it getting later and later. And I sat into that laundry room. My mother was looking for me all over the place. I come back up to the park. It's almost, it's almost dark. Um, and I remember my aunt coming up there. She was in town. And I just remember not asking what had happened. Or are you okay? I remember being yelled at and screamed at and called fast and I'm running off and what am I doing? I'm always trying to do something fast and targeted and being told that it was my fault versus being comforted as a kid. I was a child. I was only nine and a half years old. And I remember my mother was so upset that she ended up telling me I could go with one of my mentors who actually was a, a woman who worked at the park. And she became someone like a big sister to me because I was my own, my mother's only adopted kid. Um, she was somebody that was safe and I would hang out with that she would let me go and kind of mentor me. Mm -hmm. And she let me go to her house. And from that moment, I went to her house that night and then I told her what happened. And I, I remember that I was bleeding a little bit, but I remember, I remember so bad wanting to tell somebody that I wasn't even like bleeding anymore or anything. And I remember I think I took some makeup or something and put it on my pants to like get her to notice to ask me because I couldn't say it. Mm -hmm. Like that's how bad it was. And I remember 
her being like, what happened? What happened? And I just, then I just started crying and told her. And then, you know, I mean, it wasn't really good, but like, I remember going to the hospital though, and they took this, the, the samples and all that stuff. And there was a case opened and I remember having to, you know, say where he lived and things like that. But I remember being in that waiting room at the children's hospital. And I remember my aunt coming in there yelling and screaming. And my mom was just quiet. Nobody had asked me what happened. It was like, it was my fault. I understand that. Nobody ever asked, was that okay? You know, I, you may or may not know a little bit about, I think we talked a little bit about this when I called you on the phone, but I know that that assumption that a child will make when something like that happens. You know, it's it's pretty common knowledge now because I talked about it in an interview, but when I was 12, I was essentially raped by numerous guys at a party and everyone knew about it. And I remember my mom, my mom blamed me. She said, that's what you get. I'll never forget it. That's what you get. I think I was, uh, that's what you get for drinking. I'm 12, first time I ever drank. I don't remember friggin', I remember like little flashes, but that was it. I passed out. And everyone knew. And you and I have talked about this, but it's like when, when no one explains to you <laughs> that it's not your fault, your assumption as a kid is it's you. It's your fault because it didn't happen to that girl or that girl or that girl. It happened to me. So I want you to know that I fully understand that conclusion that you make as a kid when something like this happens to you, if no one goes the extra mile to explain to you what's happening, you, you, you blame yourself. So I, I, I so understand that. I'm going to um, jump ahead to, there was something horrific that happened to you when you were 11 years old in court. Can you explain a little bit about this? Because I know this is sort of the impetus to you leaving home and then becoming trafficked. So I want to start sort of when you were 11. What what happened? Yeah. Well, no, after the gang rapes, I ended up, cases ended up getting, being open with DCFS in Los Angeles County, and, and it was completely different then. They were, had a lot of lack of education and awareness, and the case was closed because there was no further evidence. So imagine, you know, you being nine and a half, and then no one believing you in anything or any justice not being served the boy did go to camp he went to juvenile hall for it and things like that multiple of them went to juvenile hall and I have to testify or anything but I remember nothing changing in my home um and then after that I remember I didn't mention though but my mentor the girl who else I went to her boyfriend I remember him forcibly um raping me like he literally shoved my mouth and started making me give him oral sex at 10 years old so my abuse started to keep continuous like every man that I came across couldn't keep, keep their hands at off me um, when I was about 10 and a half years old, um, almost 11, literally, I think I was 11, like right at the beginning around turned 11 years old, I ended up finding I was adopted, which was something that was really, really kind of like a tip of the iceberg for me after the molestation, after the gang rape, after all this abuse that I'm experiencing, not feeling like I belong anywhere and all the lies that were told to me. Uh, finding out I was adopted kind of was like the, the tip of the iceberg, like, man, I'm not doing it. Like, and I just became extremely, extremely just a different kid. You know, I was never disrespectful to my mother. I loved her. I loved her. Um, and I knew that she loved me, but I just didn't have any care. Like, you know, started running away. And I wouldn't say I was running away already at 11. I was testing the waters very young. Like, you know, yeah. street lights. come on when the street lights get off. I'm going to come home two minutes after the street lights. You know, don't go up the hill and around the corner. Now I'm going three blocks around the corner, you know, um, because there was just these lies that I felt like, what do kids do? You don't run away to something you're running from something and I was willing already at an early age to run away from myself and I didn't want to I didn't want to be nowhere near anybody that would harm me and at 11 and a half I ended up how I got in the system was my behavior started to change and after I found I was adopted I ended up catching my first juvenile case um, which led me to juvenile probation and I was at school I went to a really 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 rough school literally in the sixth grade I was 11 and a half almost 12 and um, because the way my birthday fall and I was the youngest in my class and I got to the school and they had really bad racial tension against African-Americans and Hispanics, like really bad racial tension, riots mm. all the time, blacks against Hispanics um, in Los Angeles. And I ended up getting caught up in a, in a riot after school though. And I got into a fight with a girl and I was angry. And I remember the girl, um, I remember being around a group of people 
And I never really tell this part of the story, but I remember picking up a skateboard and hitting her with it and hitting this girl right. with it um, and continuously hitting her. And I ran, went to, got on a bus, thought it, I remember laughing and like felt this power of like all my friends, everything, all this stuff, right? And I remember coming back to school the next day and the police were there. And they said I had put this girl in the hospital, things like that. Um, and I was going to be charged with assault and battery. And I ended up going to court and um, I was placed on these probation terms. And it caused a really huge problem in my family. Um, I started kind of like not really running away, but kind of trying to. Kind of trying to run away, like not coming back or coming back late. And then it all started, a shift happened um, when I was still on probation, doing my community service. And I met this girl. And she became my friend. And I always give people a description because I think it will help, especially minorities, that like how kids um, are drawn to people that have more than them or are pretty. And we're living in a society that do that now. Like, mm-hmm. I'm going to follow her because she's cute. Like, and it was this girl, green eyes, pretty hair, mother owned a home, had a mom and dad, had a grandma. Mom was a head nurse. Dad was like, worked in like, you know, the government kind of stuff, but she had this huge house in the middle of the hood. Wow. And she used to hang out at the library. So all it took was a hello. So um, I'm hanging out with this girl and. um, How old is this girl? So I was 11 and a half, almost 12. um, And Cece was about 13 going on 14. Thank you. Okay. She's a couple years older than me. Okay. She was exposed to like, she was smoking weed, you know, um, just one of that cute popping girls, right? Like had the pretty hair, had the gold jewelry on, like had the fresh dunks and the Jordans and was fresh water crop tops, everything as an 11 year and a half year girl. You're like, I want to be like her. Right. I want what she has, you know, going to her house sometimes. So then I start ditching the library, right? So now I'm hanging out with her kind of like, oh, I only got to do four hours today. Bye. And now I'm hanging out in the neighborhood. And it's funny because uh, a guy who really changed my life, who really was helping me when I was a kid, an older male, who really set his boundary and never wanted sex from me or anything, he brought this up the other day. He said, man, it was like when you was 11 and a half before you, start, before you was, tr- before you, you know, somebody was pimping you out. Like, it was like, it was coming. Like, like you would always run into men. It was like, it was, he like, I, I hate to say it. It was like, it was destined to happen. Because I remember going with her to a house that was like a dope spot. And these, this guy, was he was fine. I thought he was cute. He was older in his late 20s. And mm-hmm. he was a pimp. And going into this house, like, full of pimps. Like, it was full of pimps. And, like, he was into me. And, like, it was like he was trying to get me to be trafficked. He was trying to pimp me out. But it was like it missed the mark. Like, I would leave. And then it was like, then we would go somewhere else. And it would be pimps. And it was like it was bound, almost bound to happen so then um one day I'm at home and I remember uh I don't really tell this much I remember trying to run away for the first time because I found out my mom had a new friend Mm. right and that fear kicked in about is this is gonna happen again and I'm not gonna let this happen (laughs) he ain't gonna touch me right so I would leave or like try to leave in the middle of the night that kind of thing I remember running up the street one day to this young boy's house his name was Sergio. Still remember this little cute Hispanic boy. He snuck me through his window, and I remember almost getting ready to have sex. I remember that feeling again of laying on my back, though. It just was normal. Like, at 11 years old, rape was normal to me. Abuse was normal. Chaos was normal. Instability was normal. Like, that was my normal already growing up as a kid, laying on my back. Or being forcibly raped. That was normal. It's nothing that you could tell me that other people wasn't going through it. I just didn't meet nobody yet that had came out on the other side. It was like everybody was doing it. Oh, that's normal. Little girls having sex with older guys. That's normal. You know, guys want to touch you. Mom's boyfriend want to kiss you and lick you and have sex with you. That's normal. Really. And I remember coming back down the hill. My mom was so, so mad. And, um. And our relationship was getting really strained. And I remember coming down and then the guy was there. Well, he tried to come in the house and it was um, 
the guy who had molested me. And I remember her like talking to him outside. I do remember her being like, you know, it's not a good time to be here, da 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 da. And I felt so full of rage. Like I wanted her to react as a mama bear. I wanted him to beat him with a bad pepper spray. Like I wanted him to react. Wanted her to react to this. And I remember just feeling really, really like just unloved. And like, and I left. I decided I was gonna leave that night. I was gonna run away. So I called my friend CC up and was like, I'm about to run away as soon as my mama go to sleep. And you know, I wasn't that bold to walk out the front door. I ain't gonna lie. I still had a little bit of respect. Like I was sneaking to do it. Um, because I didn't want to hurt my mom, you know, but I wanted to leave. I didn't want to be there no more. And there was also parts of me that I was looking to be accepted into this world that I had no idea. I remember one thing I will say, my mother used to always tell me, like, hard head makes a soft ass, baby. Like, she didn't say ass, she said butt. Like, hard head makes a soft butt. And the streets don't love you. The streets will tear you up and spit you out. And it was already this, this, like, dopamine that was, like, already in me because it was like, I'm already experiencing it, oh, well. Now, I remember running away that night. I ran about, like, literally, I lived um, on West Adams, and she lived probably about, like, 10 blocks. Like, I mean, a good three miles. And mm-hmm. as a kid, you don't even think now until I'm driving. Like, dang, I walked that far. At 11 and a half, I was walking at 2 o'clock in the morning. Like, 1 o'clock in the morning. Like, walking. No fear, not nothing. That I think about that kind of stuff, too. Now I walked to her house. I got to her house. She's like, hey, hey, like. She opens the door. She's like, my grandma sleeps. And I'm like, did you tell her I was coming to spend the night? She was like, yeah, but I told her you was coming earlier. Like, you was already here. So we got, I got in there, got in her room. And I remember looking in her room like, man, like, you got your own room. Like, you got all these clothes. Like, she had everything, everything that I didn't have. And she was like, you got to change your clothes. And that night, I still had on my school uniform. I hadn't got out of, out of it, nothing. I just slipped on my pants. I had on my school khaki uniform I had on my Tuesday or Wednesday panties that my mom she, like she didn't buy me Victoria's Secret no 11 years old I wasn't getting no Target panties my mom bought me the panties that was in the pack and she bought me the undershirts that still had the little ruffle on it that had the little color string mm-hmm. I had those she's like you gotta take that off you can't wear that I'm like where are we going I thought we just hanging out she's like no 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 we're gonna go chill with my boyfriend let's go smoke let's go smoke some weed like I'm like all right she puts on these clothes I put on this t-shirt that had like some graphic on it some shorts Mm-hmm. cold as it was I think I put on her shoes or something she took my pony my mother used to have me in these ponytails but she used to have these like photos I mean these these ponytails in my head and she took them out she unraveled them took the ballies off the barrettes kind of and then pushed my hair in a ponytail like in a poofy ponytail and I was like whoa like it's making me look older right and right. then um she was like remember you're not 11 you're not 12 you're 15 remember that I was fully developed to like I started my period at nine years old so like I was already like you know it doesn't change though I was a kid right um and I remember we left got to this house we walked about like six blocks man like it was still far like, still <laughs> far. like had no we are 11 and 4 13 14 walking in the middle of the night right and we get to this house and it's in the back of this apartment building and it reeked of I now know it was crack. Like, it was dope. And we got to this house. There was a guy on the couch. And he probably was in his, like, late 20s, early 30s, probably. Still don't remember how old JB was. But a woman in the kitchen cooking. And we got into this room. It was just a regular chair, like a papa chair sitting there in this raggedy couch and a glass table. And on the glass table was a gun, was drugs, um, and his weed. And he was rolling up. He was getting ready to smoke some weed. And I remember coming in and she was like, what's up? Like, she was like, he was like, what's up, CC?" And he was like, who's your friend? And he was like, oh, this is my friend. I think my name was Brittany or something else. Brittany again. It was another mm-hmm. name. Mm-hmm. And I remember him just looking at me. And I know that look. And I just smiled back. It's like I already was conditioned already. I knew it. And she, her boyfriend came and. He pulled up, he came inside, he, he came inside and he was a lot older than her. He probably was about like 17, 18 years old. And he came in the house and she was like, you want to go smoke? Let's go hot box. And I was like, no, I don't think I really want a hot box. You know, it's just the environment did something in your gut as a kid. You still feel like something's not right. Yep. Something's not right. And I'm like, no, I'm not going to hot box. I don't want to be too high to where I'm not, I can't, 
be aware. And still that fear of being raped, you know, it's that fear that comes back. And I remember sitting on the couch, him looking over at me, he had the the blunt in his hand. He looked at me and he's like, what you doing out so late? Mm. Where your mama and your daddy at? And I was like, he like, you shouldn't be out this late. Where are your parents at? And I was just start crying. And I told that man my life story. It felt like 30 seconds. How I was adopted, how I was molested, how I was abused, how nobody wanted me. I didn't know who I was. My mother, he was smoking and he just looked at me. He's like, you're going to be straight here. You decide to stay here, you're going to be straight here. Ain't nobody going to hurt you here. And I remember felt this sense of like safety a little bit. Right. Because it's normal, right? Wasn't it wasn't nothing was like a red flag. It's normal. Right. Somebody's it's there. Somebody's listening. He's, he's listening to you. He's he's giving you sympathy. He's understanding. He's the first person at eleven years yep. old. Yeah. The first person at eleven years old a child is in contact with is saying, That's fucked up what happened to you. Right. Right? Like how imagine that feeling that comfort, not from your mother, not from a coach, not from a teacher, not a doctor, not the nurse that took the samples, not anybody. Right. And this is the the stranger is the person that's telling you, a perpetrator telling you, you're going to be straight here. Ain't nobody going to touch you here. Like to feel a sense of protection, to feel safety. And I remember he smoked and he was like, you want to smoke? I was like, I'll smoke a little bit. And I, I smoked a little bit. There was nothing odd that I was 11 and he was in his 30s. Right. Nothing at all. Right. Nothing. Nothing crossed my mind. And I remember like, I got to use the bathroom. Like I'm going to run to the store real quick. He was like, we're going to use the bathroom in the back. And I walked to the back of the room. And there was a small little room, like so it was a small bedroom, one apartment, not even probably 400 square foot, but it was a beautiful woman. She she was like um, Hawaiian and like Asian and Hispanic, like all mixed, beautiful woman. She sat on the bed, cross-legged, and she was doing something on her phone. And I walked in the back and I was like, hi. And she didn't speak to me. So then at that point, you know, my mouth was kind of a little bit more like ruthless. Then, so I was like, all right, bitch, like, like, and went to the bathroom. <laughs> When I came out of the bathroom, he was talking to her and then she spoke to me. So he had given her permission and this was the start of my grooming process. And she's like, you know, I wasn't really trying to overhear your conversation. I said, but you were, that was being nosy. She's like, excuse me. And she was like, I'm just saying like, you were being nosy kind of. And she said, but I was raped by my father, my whole childhood. And then my stepfather that my mother chose to get started sexually abusing me too. So I know what it's like. That's how I came to California. And she was like, but you're going to be good here. We like a family here. JB don't let nothing happen to, to me. Like, and I was like, well, I wasn't just like trying to stay or whatever. And I remember coming out the bathroom and just talking to her then and opening up about things, talking and looking around the room. And she had all these clothes once again, right? Everything. And I only shared it because people were like, why was such a materialistic thing? Because when you don't have nothing, even the poverty mindset still today in today's culture, you want what somebody else has. Right. And that's the reason why celebrities, influencers get the amount of people that they have because they have access to what other people don't have. Mm. You know, so if, if people could influence an adult, they can influence a 11 year old child. Absolutely. So I was in her room and, and didn't know all this stuff was stolen, you know, or like <laughs> however they got it. Yeah. And I was like, so what do you do? Like, why are you getting dressed up? And she was getting really pretty, like putting on this, this outfit. And I'm like, where are we? Like, where are you going? And she was like, well, I'm going to work. And I'm like, work. At one o'clock, right? Now my time is a little off because it had to be like nine when I left. One by the time, and she's like, "Yeah, I just came from work, but I'm about to go back to work." And I'm like, "Where do you work at?" And she tried to give the nice, glamorous escort, or try to empower me to say that she took men on dates, and she, that's how she redefined her feminine power. Mm -hmm. Right? This is what she was telling me back then. And I'm like, "Oh, okay, but what is that?" And she's like, "Got prostitute." I'm like, "Oh." Prostitution. No, 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 no. Uh -uh. You like a hoe. That's what you are. Oh, <laughs> you I, said this. I'm you said this at that. 11. I don't, do I don't want to do that. You said this at yeah, 11. Like, oh, you're a hoe. Like, hoe. Like, hoeing. Wow. Yeah. Like, I'm like, oh, that's hoeing. Like, oh, we just, I didn't say prostitution. I'll tell you back. I was like, that's, oh, you're like hoeing. And she was like, no, prostitution. I was like, okay. And I was like, ah, I'm not here for that. And I remember him coming in and um, JB had this, he had the cigar in his, in his mouth and he had this little plastic black bag and he was like, you want to take a bath? Like, I know that you want to 
And I was like, yeah, cool. That, yeah, yeah. Because I was like, had my, my her clothes on. You know, I wanted to get out of her clothes. And I remember him coming in and bathing me. It felt good to be bathed, like to be soothed for someone to pay attention to me. And I remember like being in the tub and like kind of like covering up my body. And he'd be like, your body is beautiful. Like <sighs> you're exactly made how you're supposed to be made. And it's, it's beautiful. It's worthy. Like, you know, it, it can also be like, he didn't say bought at a price, but he like people pay thousands of dollars, you know, and I'm sorry that people did that to you, but you know, they didn't know your worth. They didn't know your mm. worth. They didn't know, they didn't know your worth. Mm -hmm. And I remember him, ba Ugh. I just remember him bathing me like, and it felt good. And I got out the tub and he. Oh, I never really told this in detail. Like, I don't really tell stuff like this yeah. in detail when I'm telling my story, you know? But, like, I just remember him caressing me, like, you know, and me desiring him at a, at 11 and a half, like, like, wanting to be in this family, this false family. And I remember I got dressed and I had on these plaid shorts that was green, black, and white, and a white beat, a white beater, white beater, whatever that was green and these bamboo kind of sandals that had the thong that you would buy for the beauty supply. And I had like this little bitty thong that you could tell was like bought at some chonquito store. That's what I call them, like a little store or whatever. And um, I remember putting it on like a thong and I was like, oh my God, it's a thong. And he was like, don't worry, you'll never have to be out there like her. Like, it's already trying to put turn me against her kind of in a way. And like, you my princess, like you going to be like, you my pride, you going to be my prized possession. Like, so he's telling right. me. So we get in the, in the living room, we go out, and then she tells me these rules. She's like, I'm gonna just tell you some rules. Don't ever sit in my front seat. I bought this car, I paid for this car. You feel me? Like, I make sure daddy is good. And I'm like, Daddy, you call him daddy? Like, right. what? And not really understanding that now this is my grooming process. And I'm like, All right, like, I guess, but it kind of felt good, like, daddy, in a way. He didn't have sex with me that night, but I remember, um, I remember going out to the track that night in Los Angeles to Long Beach Boulevard. And I watched this woman get out the car. So mind you, this is the first night. So I watched her come back and forth to the car and she was handing him money and stuff. So we start talking, he's smoking and he's telling me kind of about the game. And we a family and we look out for each other. And, you know, she making sure we good and we straight and how we fed. And, and, and in exchange for that, you know, I make sure she's safe. And I love her and I make sure that she feels good. And, all this right. stuff. I make sure that we provided for. We got a roof off our heads and all this stuff. And I'm like, I don't want to do that. He was like, and he just didn't say anything. And I remember coming back to the car and him telling her that I was going to go with him. Kind of. And I just remember crying and being scared. And I got out the car. Because you follow instructions. You know what to do. It's kind of already in you now. You know, it's been ingrained in you. And I remember walking down Long Beach Boulevard. A white pickup truck came, a four-door. And it was a Hispanic man. And he spoke to her in Spanish. She spoke back. And we got in the car. And I remember like a two for one special kind of thing, Oof. basically. And at 11 and a half, I watched this woman give this man a blowjob. Give him a blowjob. And I'm in the back seat crying, shaking. He starts speaking her in Spanish, like yelling. His tone is loud. And he basically is like, get out the car. Get out, get out, get out. You know? And um, they exchanging words. And we get out the car. And I remember just crying. And she was like, suck it up. Like, you won't survive out here like that. You got to grow up and grow up immediately or you're not going to survive. And it was this look of fear in her face, like fear. Fear, hopelessness that I had seen, that I didn't see at the house. You yeah. Know? And we got back to the car. I was crying and JB just, he hit me and dragged me out the car. Like he literally like hit me in my face and dragged me, got out the car, pulled me out, dragged me down Long Beach Boulevard. And I remember him just saying things like snatching me up afterwards and being like, you think somebody loves you? Look at everything that the people did to you. Look what the men did to you. Don't you want to get paid for this? Don't you want to take take your power back? Like he was very manipulative, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And he was just like, this is for your own good. Like, this is how you're going to survive. Like, nobody's going to look for you. Ain't nobody going to look for you. Your mama gave you up. Like, your mama ain't looking for you. I guarantee you if you go home right now, she's not going to want you. And that night, I knew what it was like to be raped seven to 15 times a night. I know what it was like to lay on my back. That night? To be numb. And every single moment, a piece of, piece of me died. Yeah. I turned like seven days that night. Oof. And we went from the track. Then we got a hotel. Then two guys came in a hotel. And I knew what it was like to be numb. 
to be numb. And I knew that even through my body, my physical body, like how did these men not know that I was a child that was laying they down knew. with me? And I, would, I knew what it was to now pay a man, pay a man for it, pay a man for what had just happened. I gave him my money. And I remember that night him holding me and her, like I laid in front of him, she laid in back of him, like, and that still felt normal. And I remember him taking me home the next day. And I remember in my window, there was a lock in my window. And then my mom had put a brown bar in the window. Like, basically, so I couldn't get back in. And I remember coming back to the car, and he was like, told you. And I was out there for a couple days. And because of my conditions of probation... My mother had reported to the probation officer I was gone. So there was a warrant out for my arrest. I had a court date. I missed it. I was out there for like two weeks with JB in and out of motels, in and out of hotels. This is what's happening. You know, going back and forth to Long Beach Boulevard, foot fig, in and out of different motels, you know, posting ads. She's posting the ads and then someone would come there. She would like negotiate for them to have sex with me and pay. And so I didn't post ads when I was young. You know, she would post them and then they, she would just negotiate. And um, I remember that I got pulled over. It was late at night. I was in East Los Angeles and the police pulled us over. And she kind of ran because she knew at this time, law enforcement was still able to pull over youth and for truancy, like not truancy for late night curfew. Like, why are you out at one in the morning? And I remember I, I froze like he had gave me a name to tell everything. And in the process of like two weeks, you're taught how to how to talk, how to walk, what to say how to do it, how to eat, how to sleep, how to breathe, what you going to wear, how you going to have your hair. And it was like, I rapidly, a growth spurt within two weeks. Like this girl that had a ponytail, bushy eyebrows, now had them waxed, now wearing nails, now wearing extensions, Jesus. now having heels, having hardly anything on. And I remember the police asking me and I couldn't give him. He was like, kid, what is your name? What is your real name? Because I gave a name and he was like, this is not a real name. And I froze. And I gave him, he said, you have a warrant out for your arrest. And I remember them picking me up. They didn't pick me up a solicitation or anything, but they picked me up for the warrant. And I remember going in there and I went to Stillmore, California, um, because at the time that was Barry J. Nordoff, Juvenile Hall up in the Valley. And see, Los Angeles County at the time, over almost 10, 10, over 10 years ago, was they didn't have really a lot of young kids that were being incarcerated. It was only 16, 15 year olds, probably some 14 year olds. I was the youngest at the facility with another young girl who was 12 and she was there for burning down, try to burn down her mother's house, like her parent, her foster parents. Mm. I, not like that, but like she was in there. I think it was her mom and dad. She tried to burn them down, but she was being molested and stuff. She tried to burn the house down. So she had some mental stuff. And I remember like it was so overpopulated. We slept in these boats in the rec room, in the dining hall, because it was filled. I remember coming and banging on the thing, like everybody looking to see who was the new girl coming in. And that was my first time in juvenile hall. And now I'm 11 and a half. I, I think I turned 12. I turned 12 in juvenile hall. And I remember, I remember literally like being Oh, surrounded with girls now that was in prostitution, like and girls who had committed robbery, burglary, girls that was in in the shoe that was fighting murder, getting ready to go to YA. Like I was now exposed at eleven and a half now to a whole other right. world. And then I sat in juvenile hall at eleven and a half for three months, and I kept coming back to court. I kept coming, coming back, and I had an amazing judge. Her name was Judge Sloan, and she actually emailed me the other day. She was, at, I think, at the she was at some place and seen me in a magazine. Wow. And reached out and said, man, my oh my, how tables will turn. But she was my judge for years. And she knew. So let me not go there. But at the time I went into court, my mom never came to court. And she was like, I'm looking for the kid's mom. She was appearing when I first was placed on probation. Where is Miss Lorraine Freeman? And in the third month after my 12th birthday, I think it had to be like June. It was June. I think I got the paper. June. Um, 2008, 2009, and the probation officer of the court stood up and said, I spoke with Miss Freeman, and she no longer wants the child in the home. And when you hear that at 12 years old in that courtroom, that you're not wanted anymore by a family that signed up to adopt you, it was just like another tip of the iceberg. And I remember being in court crying. I just want to go home. I just want to go home. Mm -hmm. I remember calling her, blowing up her phone, her not answering, like 
please, please, I'll be a good kid. I'll be a good kid. Oh, so not. Oh. And then I was sentenced to six months. Uh, yeah, I was given back to the system. And because the system was different, I wasn't placed on foster care. I was going to be on probation until my 18th birthday. That mean I would never be eligible to be adopted. I had to stay in group homes. Mm. And anytime I violated, anytime I had a fight, anytime I did anything wrong, I would go back to juvenile hall. And my life became a revolving door from 11 to 18 inside, inside the juvenile system. And it's so much in my lifetime that those people became my family. And that's the redemption part of my story. Wow. Okay. I want to stop here as it's a ton to digest. Um, Ori, I'm really looking forward to hearing your redemption story as you state. And we are going to pick up with Ori, part two, next week. In the meantime, Ori, thank you so much for sharing so much of your story and what you've been through. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. You are amazing.